today's topic is on the relationship between business and the natural world. Now, I'm reading at the moment a fascinating book by Thor Hansen um, on hurricane lizards and plastic squid, which is about how nature is evolving to adapt to our changing climate. It's interesting, nature seems to do it faster than we do. Um, and in the introduction, Hansen makes the observation that the human brain is capable of understanding and ignoring abstract threats at the same time. And I think our Prime Minister's comments last night about Europe's failure to secure its own energy independence after Russia's annexure of the Crimea in 2015 present a stark example of that, um, or indeed of the consequences of that, um, in the light of the ongoing horrors in Ukraine at the moment. But another <coughs> is our lacklustre response, and I think almost our ambivalence to our continued active destruction of the web of life, um, of which of course we are part, and of course on which we depend. This year again, the World Economic Forum's Risk Perceptions Register puts biodiversity loss in the top three global risks alongside climate change and extreme weather events. And today's focus is on the emerging regulatory and legal regimes in three fundamental economic sectors. In real estate, in investment, and in agriculture. And these developments seek to incorporate biodiversity and biodiversity risk into business practices. And I think we see in our work across the firm and with our clients and colleagues um, that, these that these changes in the context of developing expectations around the purpose of business and the fiduciary duties of directors and others present a great opportunity to change the paradigm, to unlock new approaches, to align financial, natural and social value creation. And so that's the sort of context, I think, with which we thought we'd approach today. So I'd like to start um, by inviting Ben Goldsmith to give our opening address. By way of brief introduction, Ben is the Chief Executive of Menhaden PLC. Um, previously, he co-founded the WHEB Group, which is one of Europe's leading energy and resource-focused fund investment businesses. He also he's got lots of hats. <laughs> he also chairs the Conservative Environment Network, which is a group that has a preference for decentralised, market-oriented solutions to environmental and resource issues. And in 2018, he was appointed as a non-executive board member of DEFRA, which of course is the Devar Department for Environment, Fu Food and Rural Affairs. Ben, can I ask you to come up? Thank you very much, Alex. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, slightly different perspective, speaking to a group of Michigan lawyers. Normally I come here for help and advice on different corners of my life. Um, when I first arrived this morning, we had a conversation around the disparity of experiences people had during the lockdowns. But I think common to very many people was this notion of, um, of, of, of staying in one's place and exploring the nature in that place. You know, it wasn't any longer a possibility to hop on a plane to Mallorca or, or even to go camping in the New Forest. You know, people settled for their local park or a local patch of waste ground, a railway siding anywhere where wildflowers, birdsong could be found. Um, and I think that was true kind of all over the world. I mean, photographs went viral on, on video clips of, of dolphins playing in the deserted harbour at Trieste. And I don't know if people saw the wild boar families trotting through um, uh, Berlin, you know, and uh, the, the, the Himalayas visible from Delhi for the first time in kind of two generations. You know, the, 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 there seemed to be a kind of upwelling f of, of love for for our natural world um, in a way that I'd never seen before. You know, I remember as a teenager going to a dinner party and sitting next to a friend of my mother's and she'd say sort of, um, ah, you're the one that's interested in nature, you know, as if it's sort of akin to stamp collecting. You know, I couldn't believe that you know, something so totemic could be reduced to a, 
think, an equivalence to uh, stamp collecting. And, and it felt like you know, my personal love of nature suddenly became the mainstream love that everyone felt. Um, and um, so, you know, some would argue that, that we all have this, this love of nature within us, even those of us that don't know it. Um, the, the term that E.O. Wilson, the writer, coined was biophilia, which describes the innate love that human beings have for the non-human world. And um, his idea was that, that in many people there is a dormancy in that biophilia. But it's not so far from the surface. You know, an, an apartment overlooking Central Park will sell for twice um, one that doesn't. You know, we, 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 we crave, on some level, contact with nature. And just at this moment when um, the, the whole population was forced to interact with the nature in which, uh, in which we live, uh, we find a country that is desperately nature depleted. Um, many of us don't realize the extent of our losses, but we are among the most nature depleted countries on Earth. We rank alongside Kuwait and Malta and Ireland in the bottom 10%. Um, so countless species have gone all together, you know, red-backed shrikes and lynx and the wild boar is making a, 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 a quiet recovery in some corners, the beaver is now back, um, white stalks have been reintroduced, we're starting to rebuild but we've lost countless species and, and those that remain exist at a fraction of their former abundance. We, I don't think we can quite conceive of the abundance that our great-grandparents knew. You know, hedges literally thronging with songbirds, you know, wildflower meadows, you know, as far as the eye could see, riotous with colour. You know, the, the life in the North Sea and the English Channel, you know, 150 years ago, would have been unfathomable. You know, herring, herring shoals that were 10 miles by 10 miles, that when they moved offshore, they left six feet of eggs on the, sea, on the seabed. You know, um, so so we, we've lost an unbelievable abundance as well as a diversity. And um, I think that... Um, you know, I, th I think that DEFRA in the last five years, last six years, um, under Mrs. May's government and then more recently under Boris, with Michael Gove first and, and, and then George Eustace, has put in place a bunch of frameworks that, that, for the first time in my lifetime, offer the possibility of rebuilding these losses. Um, and um, I know we're going to talk about some of those today. We're going to talk about the Environment Act 2021, which is perhaps the most comprehensive environmental legal framework of any major country in the world. It runs to 400 pages covering everything from single-use plastics to legally binding targets on reversing biodiversity losses. It's a, it's a spectacular piece of legislation. Um, the Fisheries Act doesn't go as far as it could, but it certainly sets the stage for, for beginning the work of restoring life to our seas. Um, I'm hopeful that the government will ban bottom trawling in our Marine, I mean, who, even, who can even imagine that there is bottom trawling in our marine protected areas? But the government, I think, is now on the cusp of, of expelling that ruinous activity from at least our protected areas, which cover about 30% of England's waters. And I think among, among the pieces of legislation that, that DEFRA has brought forward in the last five years, I think the Agriculture Act 2020 is, represents the biggest win for nature we've ever seen in this country. 75% you know, of England is farmed. Um, and um, under the Common Agricultural Policy, there was a direct incentive to farm every square inch. So you got your payments based upon the amount of farmable land that you own. So if there is scrub, the eye in the sky sees that scrub spreading, or you have a little wetland which is full of bulrushes, that is not farmable land. So demonstrably, you must remove that nature in order to make it farmable, in order to get the subsidies. Therefore, a direct incentive was created to farm intensively every square inch, no matter how suitable for farming. Um, that direct incentive has now been flipped on its head under the Agriculture Act. So the new scheme, which operates under the slogan, public money for public good, um, with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a more technical title, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, will directly reward farmers for acting as stewards of nature, for rebuilding nature. And it's gonna do that across three tiers, and I, I guess we'll go into some detail on that a bit later in the panel. Uh, but, but fundamentally, we have, you know, to simplify things, two kinds of land in this country. We have the roughly 20% of our land, which produces roughly 85% of the food we produce, mostly in the east. So we have the highly productive land on which we need to see a transition towards regenerative farming. We're losing our soil at the rate of anywhere between 1% and 3% a year, which is clearly not sustainable if our children and grandchildren are going to feed themselves. The, 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 the rivers and the coastal environment of England was not always brown. You know, Blackpool Pier or Brighton Pier you know, shows you a kind of brown sea. It wasn't that way. There were vast oyster beds, 
There were, where there weren't oysters, you had vast seagrass meadows in the estuaries, and the water would have been a lot clearer, but the soil is simply being washed away by unsustainable farming practice. Well, in America, there is a no-till revolution taking place now. Um, nearly 40% of American arable farmers will not plow their land this year. Um, they will drill the, the seeds directly into the soil in a technique that banishes plowing, which is one of the main causes of erosion. So uh, we need a shift towards regenerative farming. We need to combine um, the, the, uh, the best of ancient wisdom, things like um, protection of soil and rotational practices, with the best of modern technology, the things like um, satellite imager imagery and drones and soil sensors and precision application of pesticides. You know, if you get a little bit of eczema, you don't smear your entire body in steroid cream. You know, we need to be much more um, uh, precision in our use of these things. And, and the new schemes will, will reward that transition to a much more um, regenerative approach to productive farming in our good land. Across much of the rest of Britain, the land is simply not suitable for intensive farming. You know, the least productive 20% of our country produces less than 3% of the food we produce. So we could shift the emphasis towards nature recovery on 20% of our land and see if we ceased all farming, which no one is proposing, you'd see a 3% reduction in, in food produced. In practice, the way we rewild our landscapes in those places is through the use of native cattle. Before human civilization, you had large numbers of wild bovines. You had the aurochs or the wild ox, and you had the bison in their tens of millions across Europe and Russia, including Britain. And then with the rise of human civilization and agriculture in places like Britain, we moved towards native longhorn cattle. And if you'd visited the Lake District or the Yorkshire Dales two or 300 years ago, you'd have found a kind of scrubby, kind of constable um, wood pasture landscape grazed by longhorn cattle, grazing, browsing, trampling, pooing, and it would have been absolutely heaving in nature. So all we need in our less productive landscapes is to encourage those farmers who think they should be intensive farming these landscapes that can't sustain it because of the subsidies they've been receiving, encourage them to shift back to a more traditional, more extensive way of farming with native cattle at lower numbers. And they'll be rewarded not just by the public schemes, but by a whole suite of new private markets for natural capital that are growing up. So the, the Wessex Water Company in Poole is now paying several hundred farmers several million pounds a year in aggregate to reduce the nitrates and phosphates running off their land and to increase the amount of nature on the steeper slopes and so on. Because the cost for Wessex Water of doing it that way was far less than, than the cost of building a massive water treatment plant in Poole. Uh, the, the, the team within Wessex Water that designed that deal or they call it that stock exchange for local natural capital, have now spun out of Wessex Water and formed a business called Entrade. And they have 12 such markets, either under construction or now up and running. I live in one of them in Somerset, whereby farmers are being paid to do various things around cleaner water, around flood mitigation, around slowing the flow, around rebuilding soils and so on. And so there, there is a suite of private markets growing up around the new public schemes that will additionally reward farmers for shifting towards uh, the protection of soil and the rebuilding of nature. So I, I, I believe that nobody on any side of the debate has recognized the scale of the change that we're about to witness. And I think in the next three, four years, um, we're gonna be the first industrialized nation to show how you can restore nature on a grand scale. Um, so I think that's an exciting area for Mishcon to be involved in and, and all the rest of us, and um, something to be celebrated and defended in the moment of the the, the rise of the small but vocal anti-net zero movement. Um, and uh, with that, I thank you very much for inviting me here. Thanks, Ben. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, so with that introduction, I'm going to ask James um, to, to come up <coughs> um, and, and, and talk um, focused on the real estate sector. Um, James is a founder member of <coughs> Urban and Civic. He's group director of strategy and planning and leads on strategy and planning. I mean, <coughs> leads on strategy and planning. Um, and, and, but, <coughs> but, but, also, but also communications um, across its portfolio of strategic sites. Um, he's the architect of the innovative and fle flexible planning structures which underpan, under, underpin the master developer approach. Um, during a 20 year career, in the real estate sector, focusing on regeneration, planning, design, environmental and compulsory purchase. James has managed a full range of development projects 
from City of London office developments um, to both residential and major retail-led regeneration schemes. Having served as a non-executive director uh, of the East Thames Housing Authority uh, Association and sat on the development co committee of l &Q, he is also a senior advisor to Dorrington PLC. So James, please. Thank you. I realise that CV is a little bit out of date on the basis it says a 20-year career, and it's unfortunately now near 30 years, uh, so um, forgive me. Um, uh, I, have, I have been asked to give you a bit of a perspective from the real estate side in relation to biodiversity. As I'm sure you'll appreciate, real estate is a broad church, um, and, uh, and as per the introduction, urban and civic approaches it specifically from the large-scale strategic developments, mixed-use developments, sustainable urban extensions, new communities that are being brought forward, and we have around 14 of those around 100 miles of London. So we are delivering, we've got about 36,000 consented homes um, on a range of sites, but with those homes come significant elements of infrastructure delivery, and that the green infrastructure on those sites, as Ben was alluding to in the, in the introduction, is as important for those communities as the grey infrastructure and as the community infrastructure. And the pandemic has taught us that what used to be discussed in the context of these site type of sites as dormitory communities where people would flow out of them during the day, come back in the evening and only be present at weekends, the focus on local and local in terms of the green spaces in particular and the access to nature and the appreciation of nature that Ben was talking about is absolutely critical. And it's critical from not just a community perspective, but it is also critical from a value perspective. It is very much not a zero sum gain. The investment in the environment at a very local level around schemes actually creates a real desire for people now to select those places to live. And we saw that during the pandemic, when the cities emptied, when those that were trapped in uh, flats without access to green space, and even in the very early days of the pandemic, the concept that local parks within London were gated, were locked. I mean, that's extraordinary, right? Absolutely extraordinary. But we went through that, and then they were opened back up again. And that people's importance attached to, to green spaces was key. So the environment bill that has come into effect in 2021 creates now particularly a framework for biodiversity net gain. And I'm going to focus on that for the purposes of this morning. But it, it is, and I want everybody to think about this, is biodiversity net gain is part of the importance of green infrastructure. And the environment bill and biodiversity net gain does not change the habitats regulations. It doesn't impact upon the importance of our environmental impact assessments. It is very, very specific around the boosting of um, a biodiversity. And the interesting point really, and the starting point is that it's boosting biodiversity within the red line, primarily. So the Environment Bill brings forward the obligation to deliver a 10% biodiversity net gain. That comes on the back of the government's 25-year plan, which came in in effect in 20, 2018, when Michael Gove was uh, the Environment Secretary. Michael Gove is now uh, the Secretary of State for levelling up communities, uh, etc. And so the, um, uh, the interesting thing there is that he's moving from an environmental base into a delivery base. And we know that environment is something that he is fundamentally passionate about. So we can expect to see the planning system responding to the Environment Bill. And in fact, the Environment Bill effectively modifies the Town and Country Planning Act. So the obligation to deliver 10% biodiversity net gain um, it starts with the premise that actually all applications coming forward, once this takes effect in probably late 2023, will have to show how they are achieving that obligation to deliver a biodiversity net gain of 10%. Now, 10% doesn't seem like a lot, but it is quite difficult to achieve. And it rests upon this concept that's been brought forward through Natural England of the biodiversity metric. So it's not that they're going out and they're measuring 
you know, individual bugs and beasties and flora and fauna to create that biodiversity net gain. The, the, the metric effectively takes a proxy of different types of landscape that are being delivered that are on the site at the moment to establish a baseline and then different types of landscape with different ratings for their biodiversity value that are then being brought forward as part of the development. Now, as I say, real estate is a broad church, so we're talking about town centre developments. We're also talking about large-scale out-of-town developments. What we're not talking about, and I would highly commend, by the way, this document, which is a DEFRA document, all credit to the department, but this document, which is the consultation that they've brought out on the details of the Act. Because the Act was a quite frank a bit of a teaser Ben it was you know it, it told you it told you the headlines as to what you wanted but it didn't really tell you how you were going to do it and how you were going to get down into the detail and what was going to be included and what wasn't going to be included so for example the document here the consultation document is saying that domestic homes planning consents around domestic homes will be exempt from the biodiversity net gain requirement even um, uh, changes of use will be exempt from the biodiversity requirements and general permitted development requirements and, and the like. But, it, and there are, there's a de minimis rule in there and other things, but it is an exceptionally well-written document which takes you through the whole ethos behind biodiversity net gain and how it will be, uh, it will be achieved. Um, and, and what it also goes into is this concept that not everybody will be able to deliver 10% on their sites within their red lines. So it then also creates this concept of the idea that you will be then capable of delivering off-site. Now, the priority is to deliver off-site locally. Obviously, if you're creating a development impact, then you also want to create biodiversity benefit locally to where you're creating that development impact. But that might not be possible. So then it opens up the concept of markets that Ben was talking about elsewhere in sort of the becoming more and more prevalent within the environmental field. And that's where you are starting to purchase biodiversity credits. Now, there's a private market for biodiversity credits which are established. And that is where the idea that people will be going out and creating biodiverse banks, biodiversity banks, which will then enable people to buy from those biodiversity banks credits to support the delivery of the development on their site. And in the event that the private market isn't there, there is the concept of a statutory bank. So there is something that sits behind that's sort of anchored by government. So the market will, will effectively work. And again, we're anticipating that the move and the evolution of that will happen during the course of this year and into next year. Now, from my introduction, you won't be surprised to hear me say that the importance in reality is to push people to deliver on site. I, I, there, is a, there is a ethos, there is, a, there is an approach out there in the market where actually people would far prefer, some people would far prefer to see the idea that there's no on site delivery, that this is just a credit scheme that you are then investing in rewilding at a large scale in and around the country and in effect it's partly an environmental tax that you're therefore paying out to go and fund those um, elements. But fundamentally for me and for the way in which we as, uh, as a company bring things forward and actually the development industry as a whole and in response to the way in which people are, uh, are appreciating green spaces, the importance is to deliver on site. And how do you go about doing that? Well, you have to be really structured in the way that you, you do it. You really have to think about it from the very outset and you have to be able to incorporate and make your green spaces as multifunctional and as, and as valuable as you possibly can. You have to think of them both as pathways, receptors, nodes. And the good thing about biodiversity metric three, which is the, the natural England metric, is that they have properly expanded the concept of biodiversity measurement within urban areas as well. So tree canopies, the full extent of tree canopies is now included within that metric, which previous metrics weren't. So actually, we think that achieving 10% is very doable. And we are currently working, we, we've been doing it for a, the last four or five years, and we're moving up to an average at the moment of about 6.9% biodiversity net gain on our sites. And we have a target of hitting 12% biodiversity net gain across our sites by 2025. But we are heavily investing in that and putting those frameworks in place for our teams. And so the developers in the room, 
That's the challenge. You've got to be acting now. It is not something that's easy to do, and I really hope that people don't therefore think it's just something that they can pay away and hope that it will, it will all be all right, because that will miss the point and miss the importance of actually achieving on-site biodiversity net gain. There's lots more points that we can go through, but I'm conscious that we're going to move through agriculture and investment as well and take other questions in relation to the panel. But the challenge is there, and as I say, Ben, excellent document. Highly recommend it to everybody here. Thank you very much indeed. James, thank you. <coughs> Um, next we've got Holly, um, and it's interesting already from taking from what Ben was saying at the beginning, it was six feet of herring's egg, sorry, this is why I was struggling to pay attention because I was thinking about that but, as well, but um, already in, in it following the two talks you've got the, the sort of the integratedness of these different areas that we're talking about already being, being coming out, you know, on site but then off site and off-site, Holly's going to talk about banks. Hang on, we've got Vianne in the corner here. It's kind of coming together in my head, maybe. Anyway, Holly's story is, is going to talk to us next. She's Head of Environment and Sustainability <coughs> at, the, at the Rural Land and Popul Property Specialists, uh, GSC Greys. She studied at Cambridge and worked for four years at, at the Wellcome Trust before heading home <coughs> uh, to North Yorkshire. Um, um, after completing an MSc at Lancaster Environment Centre, Holly joined GSE Greys um, as a farm business consultant, specialising in um, agri-environment schemes. And she now leads, as I said, the Environment and Sustainability de Department there, uh, delivering environmental projects and advice on sustainable land management for farmers and landowners of all shapes and sizes across the north of England from small family farms to large rural estates. Lovely. Thanks very much, Alex, and good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here this morning to share my perspective on biodiversity as it relates to agriculture and rural land management. Ben has slightly stolen my thunder a little bit with his talk about the Agriculture Act, um, but all is not lost because I hope that I can offer a little bit of a different perspective on it, um, kind of coming from the point of view, I suppose, of people working on the ground offering advice to farmers and landowners. Um, as Alex said, our clients uh, cover, cover a very big range um, of different land managers, um, so that's both farming businesses, um, whether they're tenants or owner occupiers. Um, but also some of the biggest landowners um, in our part of the world as well, um, whose assets range from forestry and grouse moors right down to um, smaller nature reserves or productive arable land. So there's a really big range, a big church of, of different people involved in the work that we do. Agricultural production, of course, relies on natural systems, um, weather, pollinators, water quality and supply, soil microbiology and so on. We really rely on all of those natural assets and systems in order to produce food from the land. Unfortunately, the intensification of agriculture has all too often gone hand in hand with the depletion of natural capital. Over time, we've been consistently taking out more than we've been putting back in. And farming has made a substantial contribution to biodiversity loss. Now, though, we're being challenged to help to turn that tide, to be part of the solution. And I think there are exciting opportunities ahead, as Ben has alluded to, to discover or in some cases rediscover the ways that we can farm in a way that will restore biodiversity, farm with nature, while also maintaining commercial advantage and sustaining levels of food production. A lot has changed over the last few years to drive biodiversity and environmental management up the agenda in our industry. And some of the factors um, that we've seen will be common to many of your businesses and sectors as well. So, the rise in ESG, for instance, net zero targets, the need for greater transparency within supply chains, um, and also the, the public scrutiny of the way that we manage or in many cases, unfortunately, mismanage our natural resources. We have also seen a dramatic change to our agricultural policy, the phasing out of the EU's common agricultural policy and the basic payment scheme, which is that area-based payment that, that Ben mentioned, um, which is paid annually to farmers for each hectare of land that they keep in agricultural use. As those direct payments are phased out, they will be replaced by ELM, which is the system that DEFRA have designed, or I should say are designing, um, to deliver against the principle of public money for public goods. 
I say are designing because there are tests and trials and pilots still ongoing and we're very pleased to be involved with a number of those um, and we're learning a lot of, from those and I hope that DEFRA are as well along the way. And these new schemes will also allow land managers to blend public and private finance in a way that they haven't been able to do before. It opens up a lot of new opportunities um, for farmers and land managers um, from private markets. And I also think it's quite clever the way that DEFRA have de de defined public goods in that they've defined them as things that aren't rewarded or aren't adequately rewarded by the private markets. So the opportunity is there as those private markets and the private finance grows for environmental projects for DEFRA's remit in terms of the environmental land management system to shrink accordingly. I think they're understandably keen to allow the private sector to pick up the tab for nature recovery wherever possible. And the structure and the framework of how we might do that is very much still being worked out and it's, it's quite exciting to be, to be part of that journey as I said. These reforms will really start to bite over the next five years and as well as being a huge opportunity it will also be a time of real challenge and hardship for many within the farming sector. It's um, quite a well-known fact that for an average farm business, um, the basic payment scheme currently makes up more than half of their farm income. So these changes are also going to be a hugely important driver for change in the way we manage and use land going forwards. Unproductive land that has previously been propped up by subsidy and kept in agricultural produ production as a result may no longer be economically viable and farmers will have a big hole in their budget. Environmental projects could provide a new income stream to sit alongside that farming income or perhaps in some cases even replace it. And it's against this backdrop of change and in many cases uncertainty that we're also considering the challenges and the opportunities posed by the Environment Act and the new requirement for biodiversity net gain which James has outlined. A recent report by FTEC commissioned by DEFRA has estimated that the total predicted annual demand for biodiversity units in England for off-site provision of biodiversity gain will be around 6,200 biodiversity units and that's equivalent to about 6,300 hectares of land per year. Now we know that the majority of land in this country is farmland so in many cases these receptor sites where biodiversity gains can be delivered and then sold will have to be found from land that is currently in agricultural use. This isn't spare land that's waiting for a good home in many cases. It has received decades of investment to improve and then maintain its agricultural productivity and taking land out of production can have a knock-on effect for the profitability and the viability of farm businesses as a whole. It's likely that the most suitable sites will be those with lower agricultural value as well as lower biodiversity value and these less productive areas of farms may not be profitable without subsidy but farmers considering future land use on those more marginal areas are already being pulled in several directions at once. These are the same areas that the government are already eyeing up to help them meet their ambitious and admirable tree planting targets, which farmers might need to help them put together a competitive application for a new elm scheme, or to use as a carbon sink to help them meet their own net zero objectives, which many of them are working towards. Now, of course, not all these uses and schemes are mutually exclusive and DEFRA are working hard to make sure that they're not. But it's important to recognise that biodiversity net gain is not the only opportunity on the table. In time, the suitability of a site will also be in part determined by the local nature recovery strategies. These are regional strategies that are being developed to guide investment in conservation. What should we do and where should we do it and how do we ensure it's well connected? but they are unlikely to be ready for use in time for the net gain requirement becoming mandatory in two years time. As this is a brand new compliance driven market, few landowners have a good understanding or awareness in some cases of the opportunities that biodiversity net gain might present. Those that do understandably have reservations and questions. For example, how will land and payments associated with biodiversity net gain be treated from a tax perspective? Will that land still qualify for agricultural property relief, for instance? Is it likely that a biodiversity scheme may result in that land falling under some form of statutory protection, some form of permanent um, land use change that will be mandated um, in the future? And what is the impact of that on the capital value of the land or the 30-year conservation covenant that may be in place that also would have an impact on the capital value? Who will meet the cost of bringing those sites forwards, both in terms of baseline surveys and the biodiversity calculations, but also obtaining the relevant consents? 
And of course, there are key questions about responsibility and liability for these long-term agreements, which will be 30 plus years. There are also significant cultural bar barriers and skills gaps to overcome. Some farmers are businessmen and they run their farms accordingly and financial incentives will go a long way towards overcoming some of these barriers. But you only need to look at the bottom line of a lot of farm businesses to understand that money is not the only driver for them. Some of these questions we hope will be resolved by answers from HMRC or secondary legislation that's coming forwards around the use of conservation covenants, for example, which are the instrument that's being brought in to help bind landowners to these long-term agreements. But a lot also needs to be done to bridge the gap in understanding and in communication between the supply and the demand side for these new markets. Those exploring BNG opportunities today have very few precedents to draw on and are stepping into the unknown on a number of fronts. Opportunities for dialogue, such as this morning's event, are therefore invaluable, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Holly. So, um, Vianne, stepping into the unknown, I think, was um, Holly's challenge for you. Vianne is the head of sustainability at FNZ. <clears throat> um, and also a founding member of the science-based uh, Nature Insights platform, Nature Alpha, collaborating with academics at Cambridge and Oxford. She's part of the team driving the development of innovative technology <coughs> to catalyze the shift to more sustainable capital allocations. She'll explain what that means. Um, prior to this, Vian spent over a decade at the Global Asset Manager Investec and as part of a number of governmental and international sustainability advisory groups, she was a member of the Task Force for Nature Related Disclosures Technical Experts Group, so that's TNFD, um, and the business advisory groups of the Convention on Biodiversity. Vianne. Everyone, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure hearing our fellow um, panelists speak about why nature is so important. And I loved how, Ben, you started with this emotional connection that many of us have and that many of us increasingly in urban areas touch on ever so rarely now. But actually, I would just ask you to think back to the last time you experienced nature, whether that was a sunset walking on your way home from work, or whether it was like Alex and I, having had the privilege of seeing some of the most uh, endangered species in the world uh, roaming on the plains of Africa, knowing that if we don't do something now, that just won't be a possibility for future generations. And I think that's what's driven the journey for many of us, which has been a very long journey, but really it is this, this relationship and perhaps the slightly dysfunctional and um, uh, frustrating relationship that we have with nature, but one that just keeps us focused on the path of how we're going to achieve systemic change. And so my great privilege is to be head of sustainability at FNZ Group. What is FNZ Group? It is probably the, the biggest wealth technology brand you've never heard of. We manage about $1.5 trillion worth of your wealth. So we administer it. If you're making an investment in an ISA or a pension, um, we're probably the interface between you and that decision. And my great privilege was to be able to infuse that decision making with insights on sustainability and most excitingly for me, nature. And we'll talk about that in a moment. That is what Nature Alpha does. Nature Alpha helps to develop insights at scale so that investors, not just institutional investors, but all investors, you and me, we can, at the touch of a button, see the impact of our investments on nature. And we're very excited to launch that next week. But let's get back to today. Really, I think what we've heard is that there is a recognition that nature is at the heart of our global economy. And I would just caution that some of the stats that we've seen, so for example, we know that uh, nature biodiversity degradation is at the top of the list for WEF and others in terms of systemic risks. But I'd also just posit that actually in 2010, 
it was also at the top of the list. And here we are 12 years later. We have to make sure that the, uh, the movement behind this is continued. And I'll tell you why I think today is different. So we know that economic resilience is being risked if we don't do something about biodiversity loss. The numbers, an estimated $44 trillion worth of economic value threatened by biodiversity declines and ecosystem collapse. We know that there's structural risk to international stability and security if biodiversity declines, people can't grow food, people need to migrate, people need to go somewhere else. This is fundamental and that is why this degradation in biodiversity uh, that we're seeing around us is threatening over 80% of SDG targets. So if we get it right, actually, this can have a profound effect on the quality, not just of our lives today, but the future. But the challenge, so we have this issue, we have biodiversity loss, we have the climate issue, but really there's an increasing recognition that if we don't solve both, we won't solve either. And we're starting to see a move to nature focus from the regulator. So today, the TNFD, the Task Force for Nature Related Disclosures, issues its beta framework, really, really phenomenal achievement. We see Article 29, a pioneering regulation in France, which is mandating financial institutions to quantify their impact on biodiversity. We're seeing the EU-backed Sustainable Disclosure Finance Review, which asks investors to understand the impact of every single company in their investment portfolios, whether they're located next to biodiversity-rich areas or protected areas, and whether there is a, a risk to nature from those investments. So really what we're seeing is a greater focus on a green recovery with nature at its center. And that means that institutions are starting to understand that if they ignore nature, they'll be much less likely to solve their climate change commitments. And many of them have made very strong net zero commitments. So there's this challenge out there. We want to understand how to measure exposure. How do we measure the exposure of a company to nature related risk or biodiversity risk? And really what we're looking at is a data set here that really needs us to focus on the asset level information as well as the big picture. So we understand that exposure begins at the asset level. We know that we're looking at companies and their own exposed assets. That feeds through to asset managers, banks, how they're valuing these assets. Asset owners, how do they make appropriate investment decisions into these companies? And then we have the regulator and the policymakers at the top, which we've heard a lot about. These are all being affected by this issue. But we often hear this. We can't finance what we can't measure. But I would say that the challenges that are faced or that we're facing, one, a lack of scalable decision grade insights at asset level. Then how do we distribute those insights? I mean, what's the point of having insights if we can't get hold of them and use them? But then finally, how does it actually achieve real change on the ground, even if we do all these things? That's the challenge. But I would say that actually, Things are different today because we're at the nexus of three important trends. One, we have policymakers. Ben's talked about these, and so have my fellow uh, panelists. Policymakers are recognizing that this systemic threat has to be addressed, and we're seeing policy come into effect. We're seeing nature being valued. Think about the Dasgupta review, for example. This exemplifies a change in what's going on. Secondly, we have awareness. We have individuals who lived through COVID, who are experiencing nature, who want to understand what's going on around them and how they can have influence. But finally, and perhaps the biggest and most profound trend is technology. Technology means that we can harness incredible insights, incredible amounts of data, satellite imagery, geolocation imagery, financial aspects of what companies are doing, what companies are actually getting up to, their reputational risk. And we can bring all that together to actually start to quantify risks and opportunities to companies. So we completely dispute the idea that there's no data out there. We think there's a hell of a lot of data out there. And it's just a case of bringing that together. We can quantify regulatory risks. We can understand now SFDR risks. We can understand AML violations, ESG risks, sustainability risks. We can understand reputational risk. And from understanding the risk to a company, we can understand how that company is managing it. And when we do that, we can also start to look at the flip side, which companies are managing their risks best, 
which companies should we invest in, which companies should we back, which companies should we engage with, so that we have a chance of changing systemic behavior when it comes to company level, but then a huge level of assets under administration. So why is this important? It's important because global capital markets contain $120 trillion worth of money. That's quite a lot. What's also interesting about that is that about $53 trillion worth of that is going to be run using some kind of environmental, social and governance screen. So if we can start to infuse those decisions with a consideration for nature, then I think we have a real chance at change. What's also interesting is that it's not just about the asset managers at the top level or the asset owners. It's about you and me, because half of that 120 trillion is managed on behalf of us. What we're going to start to see and what we're able to do through platforms like FNZ and others is we can start to deliver insights about the impact of your investments on nature. We're starting to see it in things like the Make My Money Matter campaign. You're going to start to understand the impact of your pensions investments or your long-term investments on deforestation, on nature, on biodiversity. We're seeing the rise of environmental social governance funds absolutely blossom. This is double digit growth over the last five years or so, and it's set to continue. This for us is an opportunity of a generation, but not only that, it means that we will have agency in our own hands. We will be able to ask questions, make decisions, and actually start to affect the world in which we live. I think the final thing I want to leave you with is that this really is a moment where once we start to measure risk to investments, and that can be on an individual scale, or it can be at the systemic level, the asset management level, we can start to understand how to mitigate those risks, whether we restore, whether we start to buy or create markets, as we've discussed, for biodiversity credits, eco tokens. This is a system which should be regenerative and circular, and it's profoundly, profoundly powerful. And so what I'd leave us with is that we all recognize that nature is the foundation upon which our economy is built. We know that we can have a vision and we can achieve a vision that the global economy can work for nature as well as investors. If we reduce risk to investors, they'll be more encouraged to invest. And if we create a virtuous cycle, then we should be able to improve things for future generations and for the world to come. And so that's why we continue with this mission, coming back to the first thing I said, which is this emotional connection that we all have. We can continue this mission to make sure that every dollar invested in global capital markets is aligned with nature positive outcomes. Thank you. That was a lot of information um, and it was absolutely riveting. I think uh, the, the immediate takeaway is that it's incredible that now the whole idea of natural capital is in our daily language and a recognition in a way that's never happened before that actually nature and the health of our ecosystem really represents the health of our economy. And I think you really, you brought that to light. And we have to value it um, and we have to protect it and we have to preserve it. So I just, you talked about, you know, the amount of money that, that, that is invested, that could be rewarded. Can I just, you know, and you also mentioned that basically, you know, what is measured can then be managed. And you talked about how there is a, um, there is a data set out there, it's just about compiling it. How do you see that happening? How do you see that, because there are so many different stakeholders involved with different data sets, and there's, there seems to be a lack of transparency and kind of cohesiveness to bring all of that together, to kind of share it, not just within the UK, but more globally. How do you see that working? I really come back to this idea that if you look at the IUCN's database, it's out there. Um, TNC has incredible uh, geospatial information. Encore has amazing information. We have a hell of a lot of information about what companies are doing. Are they creating policies? Are they signed up to the UN Global Compact? Are they doing the appropriate things in terms of the equator principles? There's so much data out there. We can't do it just by thinking from one perspective. You do have to look at what the ecologists and the conservationists are looking at. You have to look at what the financiers are looking at. You have to understand what the policy makers are doing. You have to understand the ESG data that's out there. And so then you just got to get on with it. 
and try and create a framework. That's how ESG frameworks came about. You know, ESG doesn't necessarily, environmental social governance doesn't necessarily all belong together. But there was a decision that actually coming out of the UN principles for a responsible investment, we would have to quantify these non-quantifiable or non-financial risks. And so we start with a sensible framework and so we say what data is available. Let's start there and let's on day one have version one and then let's start to iterate. And so we start to see things like the EU taxonomy, which will start to refine and also the TNFD, which will create a disclosure framework. Okay, so you talked also about the, the success, but you talked about success in environmental terms. You know, we're going to have a better world to live in, and that's going to have re great rewards, you know, just for the environment, for people, for how we live, and our happiness factor, and all those kind of things. But as an investor, somebody is putting their money in. How do you measure the success of your investment? Well, very good question. So actually the success of your investment is you you want it to support you for the goals that you want to achieve so that could be financial and will be financial you want to save for a dignified retirement and live well but also increasingly we've seen that investors have values and value-driven goals that they want to achieve as well and we've seen that we've seen that companies themselves if they have good environmental management policies if they are good stewards of themselves in terms of the environment around them and their human capital, their environmental and human capital, they perform better over the long term. So actually these two goals go hand in hand in my view. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to touch with Holly and also so with Ben. So Holly, you, you talked about kind of ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme and the role that kind of rural landowners can play in actually releasing some of their 70% of agricultural land to help, um, to help the environment and to recreate and sustain new biodiversity measures. Um, there is this idea, central government, that actually when we have to, developers are coming on board in 2023 to, um, that's when biodiversity net gain starts. And the idea is that government actually front loads that with some landowners actually habitat banking in advance to deliver the new habitats so that when the developers come on board, it's up and ready, ready to go. Do you see that as being realistic in the current state of play? Particularly, you touched on tax, you touched on, I think you touched on pricing, those and also other subsidies, other reliefs. Do you see that actually all of that is going to get sorted in the next year in order for there to be not a kind of a, a logger jam when actually developers come to say, I need, I need to buy a unit. So do you want to start first? Yeah, I can do. Um, so in terms of the habitat banking model, um, it, you know, part of that may be through the, the statutory credit scheme, which will be obviously from the public funding pot. Um, part of it might also be through privately run habitat banks. Um, but a lot of how the biodiversity net gain system might be delivered going forwards would actually be through the submission of biodiversity gain strategies, which are then approved um, alongside planning. Um, and they would allow for the work on biodiversity gain sites to be commenced within a year of that planning condition being discharged, but not necessarily completed. So these will be those 30 year projects and the, the time taken to deliver the, the gain in terms of the uplift in biodiversity units will vary a lot depending on what type of habitat is being created. So it doesn't all have to be front loaded. I think that's the fun, first thing to say. I think the next two years are going to be very difficult because um, there will be those who will be happy to be front runners and pioneers, just like there are with any new development, new markets, new technologies. Um, and they might take that risk of putting themselves out there and saying, I don't know whether the price I'm getting is going to be the as strong as the price in five years time, for example, we're seeing the same thing with the carbon markets. I, I don't have all the questions, all the answers to the questions around how this will integrate with the environmental land management schemes, for instance. Um, we hope that by that point, they will have the answers from HMRC. Um, so I think there will be those who are early adopters, but there will also be plenty who will say, I'm interested in this, but I'll sit back and let other people take those risks and I'll enter the market in, in five years time rather than in two. Um, but I mean, I think the indications are that that would still allow um, sufficient supply coming through at the start of that of that period, um, because obviously it it will vary 
local authority by local authority as to how much development's coming forwards um, within that, those early years. Um, and if you're allowing trading, not just within the same local authority as the development, but perhaps beyond that, that helps to um, make a penny shortfall as well. So I think we'll have enough, um, but certainly it won't be um, all the farmers rushing to the front of the queue to <laughs> take up these new schemes. And Ben, you know, in terms of governmental departments, is it, I mean, are they talking? So when you talk about, you know, what has to happen on the tax regime and understanding what the implications there might be, and, you know, in a farmer deciding how they want to proceed, you know, and, and, and DEFRA really encouraging farmers to, to, to kind of embrace elms and the like. Do, do you see that there's a discussion amongst departments? So I, th I think, the f I think a, f a fundamental challenge of all of this is um, to ensure that public money doesn't crowd out private finance for this stuff and to make it easy for land managers to stack a bunch of payments. So obviously you don't want um, additionality whereby um, someone is being paid by Microsoft for the voluntary carbon associated with planting trees um, as well as, um, as, well as uh, uh, being paid by the government to plant those trees. You can't have um, additionality. But what you can have is a landowner paid for flood mitigation by the Environment Agency for cleaner water by Wessex Water and by Microsoft for carbon. Um, so you, 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 you can stack the benefits and therefore stack the payments and um, we need to make that possible and easy. Um, especially for smaller farmers where you've got a guy who's spending you know seven days a week on the back of his tractor maybe doesn't even have a smartphone you know you've got to try and make that easy for farmers to come together in clusters and to um, create a stack of payments that optimize their revenues from these things um, but I think um, do they speak I mean DEFRA is a minnow so DEFRA does its best to speak to all other departments but I mean DEFRA's total budget is a rounding error in comparison with defense healthcare education you know, it's, it's, the, it's the smallest, weakest department. Um, that being said, the Environment Act has placed a bunch of legal obligations on the government to do good things. And Treasury is now f knows that it's on the hook to pay for those things. And so Treasury is, um, is pretty attentive. I'd say. Treasury is definitely um, on top of what's happening within DEFRA because they know that if DEFRA doesn't deliver well, um, then they may end up having to pay twice. Uh, for the delivery of those good things. Um, so for example, if Elm was to drift back to a kind of area-based payments under pressure from you know, the, the anti-net zero campaigners in the Tory party, for example, you know, Elm was sort of dragged back to a sort of EU-style basic payment system, then Treasury is going to have to find that money all over again for delivering the environmental goods and improvements that have been locked into the Environment Act. So I think Treasury is actually probably a pretty positive influence on the nature agenda now for the first time ever. Um, I, th I think though in terms, of, in terms of the pipeline of projects, um, I think the, um, we need to think about parameters. So cr cr the sort of conservation 1.0, you know, where you manage a piece of land for the benefit of great crested newts or a particular orchid has been extremely important in saving those species. I think there are species that would have disappeared if the RSPB hadn't been absolutely focused on, you know, on, um, on, uh, on, on cranes or, or you know, whatever it was, curlews. Um, but I think what NEP, the rewilding project in Sussex, which you should all visit, shows us is that self-willed nature delivers outcomes that we couldn't even have begun to predict. Um, and sometimes, for example, you know, we, we've led, been led to believe that a species thrives in a particular environment when in fact it was simply driven there and it was the last place it survives. Turns out that golden eagles don't necessarily prefer bleak mountain tops. It just turns out that that's where they survived. And actually golden eagles do perfectly well in, in lowland mosaic scrub forests. Um, so, so sort of this idea that, 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 that we just let nature kind of do it, I think needs to take root. Um, and we need to move away from this kind of very tight set of parameters in nature restoration, whereby we're going to manage that hillside for this particular dung beetle because it's um, scarce. We're going to actually try and restore natural processes, restore the natural meanders of streams, you know, restore the natural hydrology, and then just let nature do it. And I think what we find each time is that the recovery is dramatic. Um, NEP has gone from being a, a rather unprofitable, unproductive, um, arable farm in, in arable and dairy farm in Sussex, um, ecologically almost totally stripped, um, within 15 years to having the greatest concentration of breeding songbirds of any site in Britain. So, um, so it, nature bursts back to life very quickly, and I think we, we need to um, throw open the parameters and let people get on with it, and we'll find the results just happen for themselves very quickly. 
Uh, that, that kind of leads nicely on to kind of local nature recovery strategies, which you briefly touched on, which again is in the Environment Act. And the idea is that there is a, a strategy at a, probably a county level to make sure that there are there's recovery and it fits into the whole nature recovery kind of through the UK. And the idea is that some of the biodiversity units will be will be funded to, to actually go there to help to help increase the biodiversity. And it's basically making sure it's in the right place to achieve the best outcomes. But my question here is, is that that you mentioned comes after the uh, biodiversity net gain comes into effect. So I'm going to ask you, James, how do you see the planning system and the planning regime I incorporating local nature recovery strategies? And you mentioned the red line boundary only being, you know, what you need to be aware of as a developer, but not, not having kind of full sight as a, of the overall picture. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think the, the local authority, county, regional level um, is fundamental to this. I mean, it, you know, it, it incorporates the agricultural land, it incorporates the developed, the developed land, it incorporates the urban areas, um, it inc incorporates the sort of ancient woodlands and, and the, the whole panoply of different types of, of landscape. And local authorities are very good at actually planning you know, uh, insofar as those that actually get their local plans in place, but that's a different debate and a different subject. Um, but get get their local plans in place. They're very good at actually looking at things spatially across the wider area. And there has certainly been already a, an awareness of the importance of landscape and the context of of pathways, because one of the big elements that sort of the has, has, has certainly resulted in a in a reduction in species is is the blockage of pathways across areas, and and we we do therefore need to absolutely look at that and how then development fits into that. So I would expect within the next few years you properly start to see local authority plans with green strategies within them, which are coming from the local nature to recovery strategy concept, which are showing exactly that and showing that if a development is going to come forward in a pathway, that that development has to accommodate that pathway. But planning and strategies of that ilk take time to come forward, um, uh, but there is, now an in, there is now an absolute incentive on them to do so, and they will need investment. And I think the other thing I, I, I reflect upon when we talk about landowners is that actually a lot of local authorities are landowners within their local authority areas. They hold quite a lot, actually, of agricultural land very often in, 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 their, in their areas. If local authorities can start to see that there is a, I like the stacking phrase, but there's the idea that actually that land can be made to work very effectively and from, an, from, a, from, a, from a policy perspective, but also from an income perspective, then they will start to understand, they will start to sort of utilize that. There is, however, a skills gap, and there is no doubt about it that within local authorities, I mean, God knows, design has been sort of washed away as a, as a, as a skill within local authorities over the last 10 years, and, and, and ecology and landscape are equally denuded. But there's an interesting statement in here, which is that the government has committed to effectively funding what is needed at a local authority level in order to give effect to the environment bill. Now, that's a, that's a one line in here, but it's a huge statement of investment going, into, uh, uh, going down to local authorities. If I may, Anita, mm. just to reflect on James's point, we. Um, we were part of a convening of a number of local authority pension scheme investment managers and um, it, the, the topic was biodiversity and how do we invest in this and so this is something that is starting to come up this is something that people want to understand um, one example of a pension scheme who had made a, an investment into a piece of um, a piece of land they'd managed it had been managed very well there had been biodiversity uplift and gains and that was that was really a, a, a very good example for them and they'd made investment returns so it's starting to come up at various different levels and it's visible, and it's visible. I, I think that's the big difference in my head between the carbon agenda and the biodiversity agenda uh, at the biodiversity you can get a benefit from seeing it feeling it experiencing it feeling good about the recovery of a species carbon uh, is still a little invisible um, 
That's interesting because, you know, I think the carbon uh, kind of and net zero got a lot of attention because it was very human facing. So you'd have floods and you'd have droughts and you'd have fires. And, you know, these are things that actually affected people immediately, whereas biodiversity was this, I would say, invisible thing, which actually has monumental benefits in terms of, you know, your mental well-being, your health, the role of the, the economy, the kind of, you know, and all of those things. So, so it's really interesting that now they're on an equal platform, and it's what you said before, which is you have to have both. You can't have one or the other. You need to have both. I think it's taken a while, really, to get there, though. Only this COP did we see the nature agenda come together with, with the climate agenda in such a profound way. Um, so I think there's a road to go, but a great start. Mm. I think it's, there's also some variation in that as to as to where you live and what you experience every day. You know, for a lot of the people that we work with, the biodiversity loss is a lot more tangible and a lot clearer than climate change because it's a direct comparison to what did I see when I was five compared to what do I see now I'm 65. People can, can see that from their own experience and, and that is really, um, you can see it, you can hear it uh, in the level of birdsong on a morning in a lot of areas. Um, so for me, that makes it easier sometimes communicating with, with farmers and land managers on biodiversity compared to climate, which I think some people over the last few years, we have had more extended drought periods, more significant rainfall events that are affecting production. And that is starting to be linked back to climate change in people's minds. Um, so that is becoming a bit more tangible, but I still think there's a long way to go in terms of people understanding the risk to their business of climate change, as opposed to it being something that's being imposed as an agenda from outside. Just to add one last yeah. reflection on that, in the investment world, I think it's it, it's the climate agenda that's going to help us forge the nature agenda, and I, I mean that because I mean I mean that currently because of uh, the IPCC report, because of Mark Carney's work, because of the incredible work that has been done over the past few years for our coming out of this country and and other governments in terms of convening investment managers have been forced to start to quantify the risk to their investments uh, in terms of climate. So you see lots of metrics out there which are trying to quantify this. How 1.5 degree aligned is this business and big, big data sets quantifying this models. If, and, and that will provide us, and you see it in the TNFD framework, climate has to be a part of that because if we're going to model living nature, we have to consider climate. Uh, so, so it should help us not take 10 years to get to the same place as we are with climate and the agenda, but we have to get it so that in two years when we're thinking about biodiversity and nature. We can't afford to wait any longer and certainly can't afford to wait as long as it's taken for climate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to just open the questions to the floor. So if, oh, okay, so. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Thomas. I'm an associate at Mishcon. Thank you very much for your talks. I was very interested in what you were just saying just now in terms of the interplay between the climate agenda and the sort of nature agenda, because throughout my life, you know, and throughout most of our lives, we've heard all of these sort of grandiose commitments on the international level. Granted, this is more on the natural level, but um, it's just something that Vian said about how the biodiversity agenda or the climate agenda was something that was sort of at the front of the agenda in 2010 is at the front of the agenda now. And the best example I can give is at COP26, when the nations made a commitment to end deforestation by 2030. But when I scrolled down on the article, I saw that they had made a similar commitment in 2014. <laughs> but when you look at the charts, that's not what it's saying. So in terms of this sort of nascent biodiversity or nature agenda, what can we learn from perhaps the failures of the climate agenda so far to make sure that we sort of keep up the momentum and ensure that these sort of enshrined protections for the environment are actually enforced and carried through in order to sort of help the ultimate goal, which is not necessarily 10% biodiversity net gain, but the protection and enhancement of the environment. Um, thank you for that incredibly, I felt the heartfelt comment. Um, and it's something I feel too very, very much what I think is different is that we're entering an age of radical transparency. Now, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think most conservationists are. We have to be. <laughs> um, 
we can see using satellite technology what is happening on the ground. We can see forests being cut down. We can look at Global Forest Watch. You can get real-time information. You can get water stress information. You can understand what companies are doing using um, deep learning. You can understand exactly what's going on with companies and their activities on the ground. You can see what's happening. And that's why I believe we're entering a new age where we can actually start to see and track what is going on. And that's what I think is different. Because once we start to quantify that, measure it, I don't think we can, it, it's like a tube of toothpaste, it's out there. And I fully believe, as Ben said, that in the next couple of years, we're going to see a launch, potent, potentially of a new asset class in nature markets, but we're going to see nature markets. It's going to happen, it's happening. And I don't think we can come back from that, particularly with the monitoring techniques that are available to us today that potentially weren't available to us in, in 2014 or, beyond, or before. Yeah, I, th I think also what's different um, is that this time round, there's a bunch of self-reinforcing regulatory mechanisms, both at the domestic level and the international level, that weren't there in 2014. So there are effectively laws, this country and a bunch of countries, and international legally binding treaties on deforestation. So th this time it seems to be backed up with substance, whereas before it felt like, um, well, it turns out that they were sort of airy-fairy promises. Um, but I, I also think the big realignment that's happening is that um, we're moving into a space of, 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 of freer and fairer markets in the sense that historically polluters have had a free ride. It's just, if, you're, if you're running a, a, um, a giant factory pig unit somewhere in South Carolina and um, you're, you're polluting the air and polluting the groundwater and polluting the watercourses and possibly harming fish stocks um, in, in the estuaries and in the sea, um, society has simply picked up the burden of, um, of that pollution and, and given you a free ride. Well, if you believe in free and fair markets, then the costs created by that business in terms of environmental and health impacts should be borne by that business in their own profit and loss. So I think we're undergoing a process of, partly because of increased transparency, and we're undergoing a process of, 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 of internalizing these externalities. Um, and I think that's happening all over the place in a way that hasn't happened previously. And on the flip side, um, we're seeing a growing recognition of the economic value of healthy ecosystems that didn't exist previously. So a mangrove previously was worth um, however many shrimp you could produce on it if you cut away the trees and grew shrimp there for five or six years until the, until the place was too um, 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 full of salt and, and, and degraded, you couldn't use it anymore. Well, now there is a greater understanding around the world that a mangrove forest provides a whole bunch of tangible economic benefits from uh, protection against uh, tsunamis and storm events, um, uh, protection of uh, sensitive coastlands and uh, production of sand uh, on which the tourism industry depends, um, uh, uh, nursery ground for 90% of tropical edible fish. There is an economic value to a mangrove forest that stretches way beyond its value uh, for firewood and um, a few years of shrimp production. And I think we're starting to see those, those, um, th th those embedded into the economy. And that's why Mark Carney believes that just voluntary carbon will be worth $100 billion a year uh, by 2025. Um, and so that, that's where the opportunity lies for people in the City of London, is, is participating in those markets. Now, I had a presentation last night from a group in Houston, Texas. You, know, you, you look at these guys, you'd think they were oilmen. Um, and their company is called Ecosystem Investment Partners. I'm not connected in any way, by the way. Um, they're now running a billion and a half dollars for investors. And what they do is they buy degraded ecosystems, most recently 23,000 acres of degraded coastal salt marsh in Louisiana, or, um, or um, um, a bankrupt paper mill with a whole bunch of commercial radiata pine plantations on the banks of the Mississippi. And they cut out the pines and they restore the sw cypress swamp forest or they restore the salt marsh and they generate fantastic investment returns for doing so from car voluntary carbon and from some of the US equivalents of our biodiversity net gain. In the US you have conservation easements, you have wetlands banking, all built on the same premise, just slightly different. And they've generated IRRs in the last six years of kind of mid-teens for their investors. So, so the good stuff is getting recognized and is producing investment returns in a way that can be scaled up way beyond what philanthropists were able to do pre previously. Philanthropi philanthropists have done their best to, say, to hold the line you know, during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. 
but suddenly rewilding and nature restoration is becoming an asset class. And so I think this internalization of externalities and the recognition of the real economic value of some of these things you know, is, um, is, 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 is a sea change moment, not just here, but everywhere. Um, it's not enough, you know, we need the spiritual shift as well. You know, we need people to reconnect with their inner biophilia as well. And that's a task for Nadim Zawawi, the education minister, and it's a task for the health service, and we need every department of government working on that too. But um, I, th I think exciting times ahead. I'm also optimistic. I, I completely agree that it is that realization of value that's going to really turn the tide. For me, we're not there yet in that I think the valuation of natural capital and ecosystem services is very powerful, but a lot of the time those monetary flow accounts that we see in a nice spreadsheet that look like very high numbers, for us they're not translating into revenue streams for, for farm businesses, for landowners yet. I think they will do, but what will also be interesting is to see how those valuations shift in that, you know, when transactions actually start taking place. At the moment, a lot of those valuations are based on, um, you know, value to society, and that's a very different thing to what somebody's actually willing to pay and the price somebody's willing to accept. Um, and I think that will be the point at which we can understand better what are those opportunities, what are the financial implications, and who will come forwards and, and embrace those because the, the price point is right, to be blunt, um, because there will be a big range of... of um, of levels of expectation, I suppose, from the supply side as to as to what what would be a sufficient incentive for them to put forward land and change management. Um, and in some cases, as I said, that will that won't just be a case of a, a, a change in, in in management in a small way. It will be quite a cultural shift for people. And that's something that I don't think could be underestimated in terms of um, of what it takes to move people away from something that they have perhaps been very comfortable with for generations. So taking that point, the 30 years, which is the lock-in for the biodiversity net gain, and the credit and the valuation of the credit, I mean, you really are at the moment at the beginning of a sort of a journey on that, which is you know, the, the, the government have modelled it on 20 to 25,000 pounds per unit. Uh, in terms of an assessment of over a hundred million pound market in relation to biodiversity um, credits. But for a landowner to lock it in for 30 years and then take new developments coming forward, they've then got to manage that for 30 years and factor that in and then local authorities have to be uh, uh, able and, and actually go and enforce. Otherwise the market is you know, what is the market if the local authorities are not going in and enforcing? So I'll give you an, one really big question, which is in biodiversity metric three, which I think goes a long way to answering your question. Simple, really clear, very understandable metric. Gardens are included as part of what gives a biodiversity net gain of over 10%. Local authorities are already raising their hands in potential horror at the idea of going in and enforcing against an individual homeowner on them concreting over their back garden. What do you, you, know, what do, you do? And, and so that they should do, they should go in. We all hate concreted front gardens and back gardens, but how do you manage that? And yes, there are satellites and everything else, and, but, but at a very domestic level, how do you, how do, you do that? <laughs> so my fear is that we've created a very simple system. We've got a very uncertain at the moment valuation as to those credits, early movers, are locked in for 30 years on the deal that they struck, and that's going to be the hesitancy. Once it gets going, th that will be a different position, but we, we, we might be relying upon those statutory credits in first instance as part of sort of, if you like, the market making, um, as then the rest of the market then sort of evolves around it. Just, just one last thing to say in response to your question. You, you, generational diversity, I think, is part of this your generation has to hold us to account. We have to hold ourselves to account. But it's, it's the next generation of leaders coming through who are going to have this at their heart and soul and the core of what they do and the purpose of what they do, which is why when Alex created Mission on Purpose, it's, it's a phenomenal movement within an incredible firm. You will be shaping what your clients do. We will all be shaping what we do within the system. And that's how we're going to change the system. 
Very powerful. Um, do we have any more questions? Yes. Mark Cumberledge from Fidelio Partners, and we're a board advisory business um, consultancy. Boards is where power resides. It's also where interests collide. Um, and widening the debate a little bit, um, we're at war with Russia, if not physically today, at least economically. And we are well and conscious of the fact that a lot of our um, fuel, um, oil, comes from Russia, but a lot of our food does. 50% of our cod comes from Russia. So I'm interested in the balance between food security and the debate we're having today about biodiversity. And I'm just interested to hear, is this going to change going forwards in the, who knows, short term, medium term, longer term, as we try and feed ourselves and address the balance about biodiversity? I think this one's for you. <laughs> well, only, only because I, <laughs> so I get this a lot. Th th this is a, this is um, where the action's at in terms of my Twitter feed. <laughs> so I get a lot of um, attacks on this. So I mean, I, th I, com I completely agree that food security should be a concern with or without this war with Russia. Um, and uh, I'm a believer in striving for food security. 50% um, of the food we produce in this country is wasted. You know, families on average are chucking away eight meals a week because food is so cheap. Food, food is structurally mispriced in this country and that's why we feel we can just chuck it away. Um, in, in our parents' generation, early 70s, you know, about 20% of food was wasted, it's now 50%. Um, about 300,000 acres of our best grade one arable land is used to grow food for machines. So biofuels are registered as green under various government schemes. Um, that's, that's core maize and so on, which is grown for, for biofuels, bioenergy, which strikes me as a terribly bad use of, of great agricultural land. Um, and vast quantities of food, millions of tons of homegrown grain are used to feed um, indoor raised factory farmed animals where the conversion rate calorie for calorie is terrible. You know, 25 calories to produce one calorie of, 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 of indoor raised beef, for example. We, so so um, um, we, we don't necessarily use our food in the way that we ought to with food security in mind. About 30%, 35% of the grain we produce in this country is fed to, fed to humans. Um, that being said, um, I don't think we need to worry about a conflict between nature recovery and food production. You know, the, the, as I said earlier, the, the least productive 20% of our landscapes produce about 3% of our total food production. So if we prioritize nature in those landscapes, um, and by prioritizing nature, I don't mean end farming, I'm talking about de-intensifying farming, you know, moving from 2,000 sheep to 200 longhorn cattle, in you know, the way that these landscapes were farmed for centuries before the Victorian era, um, you're talking about a negligible reduction in total food produced in this country, you know, a rounding error, one or one and a half percent, if we go as far as rewilding 20 percent of our landscapes. Um, and when you talk about the highlands of Scotland, and not that it's a defer, it's, it's not within DEFRA's jurisdiction, but there are people saying we should halt rewilding in the highlands of Scotland. Um, on account of food security. The Highlands of Scotland produce zero food and there's a lot of surplus venison there which people aren't eating. Um, but um, but so, so um, I, I, think, I think it's concocted this idea that, 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 that food security is a reason to call a halt on, on the restoration of nature given that the emphasis is inevitably going to be in our less productive landscapes. And in our more productive landscapes the only real threat to food security in the medium term is the loss of soil. You know, if, if we keep losing soil at two or three percent a year, you know, do the mathematics. You know, the next generation is really going to struggle to produce food in these places, and those are the landscapes that feed us. So, in fact, we need to ramp up our efforts to protect soil in in our productive landscapes. So, I, I um, and I, finally, I'd say that we're in as good a place as mo as any country on earth, more or less. You know, we we produce, I think, 80, 80 odd percent. You'll know the stats, but I think eighty percent of our grain of our wheat produced at home the, of, of what we consume you know, we're self-sufficient in all sorts of carrots brassicas all sorts of things and I think that when you've got countries like Egypt and Pakistan and so on that really are facing serious serious food security issues 
I think instead of worrying about our own food security, we should be thinking about sending them some food. You know, I, I, um, I don't think it's a great look. Um, you know, I think it's equivalent to um, the laptop generation calling for longer lockdowns. You know, I think it's a place of privilege that we should, um, you know, that we, we, I think we should tone that down a little bit, perhaps. Um, so that's uh, the view that I've given on Twitter in the face of an onslaught in the last three days. That's why I'm sort of... <laughs> Holly, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think one thing I would add is that um, I don't disagree at all with the idea, you know, there's some parts of the country that obviously produce a lot more food than others. Um, I do think, you know, what you said in your, your opening talk was extremely relevant in terms of bringing in those regenerative agriculture techniques and, and other um, practices which will help to bring nature back into those areas as well as those other more marginal areas because I mean, in some cases, the stark reality is it's the most productive areas that, that are the real deserts in terms of biodiversity in some cases. Um, actually, when you start looking at the marginal areas, um, a lot of those are already doing better, um, purely due to the fact that they've just um, not been hit as hard in terms of improvement and, and drives for productivity. So I think f it is really about um, strategic land use and management decisions and, and Partly, I think what we're trying to achieve is taking that beyond the, the farm by farm or the holding by holding basis. If we're looking at it as an individual farm business, the most productive area of that farm is likely going to be the area that that farmer does not want to take out of production or take the foot off the pedal or put into a BNG scheme. Um, but actually, if you look at it on a landscape scale, that might be in the bottom 10% in terms of productivity, but it's his best silage field or it's his only bit of arable ground. Um, and, and so I think that's part of why it's really important for us to start looking at this landscape level and looking more strategically and regionally um, because it will help us to identify actually how does that influence and change our decisions in terms of land use. Um, yes, it's still incredibly important for each individual business to think about that on their level, but we can achieve better results and better value for money, better return on investment if we do think about it more strategically. And the last thing is just that climate change in itself is a massive threat to food security. I think we need to keep sight of that and biodiversity loss. Um, we need to keep, keep that in mind. I'd only add one, one element to that, which is that I come back to the element of the importance of prioritising the delivery of biodiversity net gain actually on the site that you are dealing with, rather than, and I know it then limits the, mar the wider market, but that is critical in the sense that actually then it puts the efforts on the improvements in technology, the improvements in the understanding of city nature, uh, urban nature. It's not just all going to rely upon the farmer's fields to do this. It can't do that. So we've got to put, and that's what the boards of development companies need to be prioritising with their teams to be able to say, right, you know, this is, if it's going off site, we've missed a trick. How, we, how do we do that? And just one final reflection, actually not on food security, but on boards. Um, and very interested in your view on this. I agree with you, that's where the power is. We did an analysis of the thousand companies held in the most widely held pension fund in the UK. So top thousand companies. And all of the resolutions and uh, AGM questions that were coming up uh, well, actually, that had come up in 2021. There was some climate questions. Please pre prepare a climate risk report for shareholders. Do you know how many times nature came up? Once. We have to do better. Well, I think we've run out of time. But I just want to say, before we go, we, I mean, let's chat. Let's have some coffee and some croissants. But what I, first of all, I'd like to thank all, my, all the panelists here. But, but I think it was, might have seemed strange, you know, having somebody from, you know, agriculture, somebody from investment, somebody from developers, in, you know, somebody from, you know, government and passion. Um, but actually, they are all incredibly interlinked and so incredibly codependent. And you can't look at it in silos. You can't look at it myopically. You have to look at it cohesively. Um, holistically, organically, to see actually how it all links together and how together everybody has to come together to make it work for all of us. Um, so on that note, I'd just like to thank Holly, Diane, um, James and Ben. Thank you so much for today. <laughs>